Year after year, the small northern country of Iceland rates tops in the world for gender equality. Eliza Reid is the first lady of Iceland, and while she is a true emissary for her country, as a Canadian expat, she's brought fresh eyes to understanding its success. She's now written a book that explains a good deal about how her adopted country does it. It's called Secrets of the Sprakar, Iceland's Extraordinary Women and How They Are Changing the World, and it brings Eliza Reid to our virtual studio from Washington, D.C. And it's a delight to meet you. I don't know if I, uh, you know, we, we talked just before going on the air about what I'm supposed to call you. I'm not going to call you by your first name because that just feels rude. But how about just hi and thanks for joining us. Is that okay? <laughs> that sounds terrific. Thanks okay. so much for inviting me. Not at all. It's great to have you here. First of all, sprakar. That, that's a word none of us will know. What does that mean? Right. It's an old Icelandic word, also an obscure word, even if you happen to speak Icelandic. And it means outstanding women. And what I love about the word especially is the fact that it is grammatically a masculine word that is used to only describe women. And I can't think of any words in the English language that are used to describe women in a positive way. <laughs> Very good. Now, it is an unusual thing for a first lady of any country to write a book while she has that title. So uh, why do this and what made you think uh, this was a good idea? I think that's an excellent question, and I have a background in, in journalism and writing, and the pragmatic answer, I suppose, is that I had this idea for what I thought could be an interesting book right at the beginning of the pandemic, and I found myself with the time to be able to write it. But I also think, as you say, the fact that I am writing a book while I am serving as First Lady uh, says something about the state of gender equality in Iceland, that uh, I have the privilege and honor of serving in this voluntary, unofficial role as First Lady. And so, of course, I should also be able to pursue my own professional projects at the same time. And no one has given you a hard time over this? Nope, nope. Okay. You, this next question is so unfair because in a way it's like asking which of your kids do you love the most? But uh, <laughs> in order to give our viewers and listeners a sense of the kinds of people you've written about, can you pluck one out of the book and just tell us why you are so delighted and impressed, et cetera, et cetera, with this person? I uh, Just one that leaps to mind right away, I guess. I'll talk about a, a farmer called Heva, who has a farm that is the size of the UK Channel Island of Guernsey. That's 24 kilometers from Iceland's most dangerous volcano. And not only is she working as a farmer and a sheep shearer, which are very male-dominated roles, but she does it in this casual way. And I asked her if it concerned her that she was farming so near a volcano. And she said, well, if I spent all day thinking about that there might be an eruption tomorrow, I'd never get anything done today. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that sort of indicates a very practical uh, Icelandic, Icelandic streak. We did mention in the introduction that Iceland seems to be one of these countries in the world where it's actually great to be a woman, that the kinds of discrimination that you see in other countries, we don't want to say it doesn't exist, but it's much less in Iceland. Why do you think mm -hmm. that is? It's a lot of different things, and we are always very quick to say, of course, we're not perfect. We do have areas where we can improve. Uh, we have had a strong and long history of very independent, strong women. Uh, we have women at the moment in very visible positions of authority, for everyone from the prime minister to the bishop of the national church to the head of the national police service. And I think, really, as a society, we have moved past the tipping point of judging or debating whether trying to achieve gender equality is something important, but arguing maybe how we're going to get there. And we see on the indicators that gender societies that are more gender equal are more prosperous. The people who live there are more happier. They're longer living for everyone in the population, not just women. And because we've been working towards this for a while now, I think people in general are seeing how it's good for all of society. Well, you say you've been at it for a while. And in fact, I, I uh, learned a great deal in the chapter of your book about October 1975, Women's Day Off. You want to just tell everybody mm -hmm. what happened then? Yes, on the Women's Day off in 1975, 90% of the country's women decided not to go into work. And that meant both not showing up for their paying jobs, but also not doing any of the unpaid work that they were doing in the home. And predictably, the country shut down. So there weren't any flights because the flight attendants weren't at work and the banks were closed because the bank tellers weren't there. And my husband, uh, who was eight years old at the time, 
remembers it vividly because his father cooked supper and it was apparently awful. He he wrecked all the hot dogs, which actually sold out of the stores because that's what all the fathers tried to buy and prepare for their children. And it really galvanized the whole nation into showing that when people work together, you can really have a difference. And, and five years later, we'd elected a female president. And what long range impact do you think that event in 1975 actually had? It's still something that people talk about to this day. As I mentioned, then five years later, Iceland elected the first democratically elected female head of state in the world. And, and that was really a momentum that was initiated from that event. And even today, this initial day off was designed to talk about the wage inequality between men and women. And every few years, we still have well, days off or times off where women stop work at the time when they have been earning what men have earned. So every few years we have it, it ends maybe a few minutes later as we inch closer towards gender parity when it comes to equal pay. Hmm. Let me read something of yours in the book here. In many countries, the issue of gender equality is steeped in politics, affecting legislation that encompasses issues from health care to education. Here in Iceland, however, the debate is no longer whether gender equality is an important objective, but how best to achieve it. To paraphrase former American First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton, gender equality is a human rights issue, not a political one. I therefore do not see this book as espousing political views. I leave that to the politicians. I gather it was sort of important for you to put that on the record because you do have to tread a, a careful path in your role as First Lady. You can't get too political. On the other hand, um, you don't want this book to be pablum either, right? Fair to say? Absolutely, absolutely. I hope that it's uh, an interesting and fun read, but, but smart and well-researched. But you're absolutely right, especially in Iceland, the role of the president is not a political one. My husband doesn't belong to a political party. I don't belong to a political party. So I absolutely don't want to be espousing partisan political views. But as I mentioned, I, I, I firmly believe that something like gender equality is a human rights issue. It's not an issue that is pitting one gender against another gender. It's not a, a zero sum game. It's something that we are fighting for to create a more equitable, fair and successful society for everyone. And I think that it's very important to speak up about these imp important issues if we have an opportunity to do so. I bet you Hillary Rodham Clinton gets asked every day of her life to offer a blurb, you know, one of those endorsements for the back cover of a book. And I'm betting she turns down 99.9% .9 of the people who ask her. But you got her. How did you do that? Well, I, I thought of Hillary Rodham Clinton because I admire her very much. And she is a former first lady, of course. And so I thought perhaps she might be intrigued by the fact that a serving first lady had written a book on, on an issue that I know she thinks is important. Uh, I, I also have an old friend from graduate school who had used to work with her a long time and he was able to put me in touch with the right team members. And, and, um, and she got a chance to take a look at the book and, and I was so uh, grateful and happy that she enjoyed reading it. Okay, back to Iceland being, well, how about this? World Economic Forum. They have a list of countries that are the closest to achieving gender equality and Iceland has been number one. Canada is number 24. Now, uh, I imagine you want to tread lightly here, but, uh, you know, we are looking for advice wherever we could find it. What would you tell us we need to do that clearly we're not doing? That's right. I do need to tread a bit lightly, but I'll, I'll highlight maybe a few of the things that I think have been successful for us in Iceland. And people in Canada can and take, or take or leave what they will of that. Um, in terms of policies, absolutely, and I've spoken about this very often, I would say Iceland's uh, parental leave program, which is a use it or lose it system, which means that both parents uh, are allocated different amounts of parental leave is important. Also to encourage men to get involved in their children's upbringings from a very early age. There is also very affordable, heavily subsidized childcare, which results in the fact that Iceland has the largest participation of women in the workforce of all the OECD countries. We also, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, have a lot of visible role models. We have 47.5% members of parliament are women and, uh, and, and visible role models in other areas, such as, as I mentioned, the, the head of the, of the police service uh, and, and people in different aspects of society. So I think the visible role models and, and uh, systems that enable everybody to be contributing as much as possible are absolutely very helpful. Now, we don't have targets or, or um, um... I'm not sure, regulations or anything like that, that oblige uh, political parties in this country to have women 
representing X number of percentage mm -hmm. in Parliament, and as a result, maybe, uh, here we are 154 years later, and we're at 30%, and you're nearly 50-50. Mm -hmm. Do you have laws that oblige um, women to hold certain roles in Parliament or anything like that? We do not, but we do have a party list system, which is much different than the first-past-the-post system. And within certain political parties, they maybe have their own rules that need to have women in, uh, in, in sort of being at least 50% of the top number of seats. And so with this party list system, which means roughly proportional representation, so if your party gets 20% of the vote, you get 20% of the seats, uh, it does make it a little bit easier to have gender equality in Parliament. Okay, here's where I sort of gently push back on you a bit here. Okay. You know the knock. You've heard this before. I mean, Iceland, for goodness sakes, has a population half the size of the city of Mississauga, and it's a much more homogeneous population uh, as well. So you guys can do this more easily in a way that the rest of the world can't. That's the argument. You want to push back on that? I'm, I'm happy to push back on that a little bit. Um, I think, you know, absolutely there is an advantage of being very small. It means that we also see the results of things very quickly. Um, and, and, and I'm not going to argue that there are disadvantages. I will push back more on the suggestion that Iceland is much more homogeneous. It's something that I emphasize a lot in the book. And perhaps the fact that I'm an immigrant myself is something that I want to showcase. Uh, Iceland has more people of foreign origin living in the country than senior citizens. It's over 15% of the population is foreign born uh, or holds a foreign passport, which means it doesn't include people like me who have citizenship and are born and raised elsewhere. Uh, that is a lower percentage than in Canada, but it's significantly higher than the percentage in the United States, for example. So Iceland is much more multicultural than people think. And, and I think that, you know, yes, we are small, but we do have a, a diversity of, of, of needs and, and viewpoints. We have people living in isolated areas in the countryside. We have people living in urban environments, uh, different levels of education and skill backgrounds and and different levels of, of wealth and prosperity. So absolutely, we have some, some challenges too. But perhaps the biggest advantage of being small is the fact that we get to see those results maybe a little bit faster, because I, I really believe that as we see uh, tangible results for moving in this direction, it will really help to build momentum. Okay, let's go back in time. I want to talk about the fact that the First Lady of Iceland is made in Canada. You grew up... <laughs> At a you know, at a, I guess in a hobby farm in the Ottawa Valley, I won't say how many years ago, but I do. Um, I'm kind of curious. What was your upbringing like? Um, my upbringing was was lovely. I, I was very fortunate. We moved. Yes, I, I we moved to this um, hobby farm uh, when I was 10 years old, just outside of Ottawa. And uh, by hobby farm, I mean the fact that my my father's a teacher by professor, a, an English professor. My mom stayed at home, but they had sheep and chickens and ducks and various farm animals. And uh, it was it was a lovely place to grow up. And then I studied international relations at the University of Toronto, which uh, turned out to be a pretty good preparation for what I what I ended up doing and uh, moved to Oxford to go to graduate school and do a master's degree in history. And that is where I met my my Icelandic husband. And you obviously could not have imagined at that moment that this guy would eventually become president, you'd become first lady. I mean, your life has not turned out the way you planned. Is that safe to say? I think that's safe to say. I, so I don't know that I really had any kind of a plan, but if I'd imagined it, it, it was not this. But I'm, I'm so incredibly uh, grateful and feel so incredibly privileged. You are, though, living in a kind of a fishbowl that you otherwise wouldn't be living in if you did something sort of more along the lines of, of maybe what your original plans would have been. How is that? It's very interesting and takes a bit of getting adjusted to. Um, I, I found it strange a little bit maybe to meet somebody out in the shopping center and someone would say, oh, you looked much younger in real life than you do on television or, or something like that. And that's it's a little bit strange to think that people ha have seen you and, and formed an opinion on you before they've even met you. But we're very fortunate in Iceland that, that we do have quite a bit of, of personal freedom and I'm very grateful for that and it's also fortunate to be able to have the opportunity to uh, speak up about issues that I think that are important and and have people listen to them for the for the time being at least. There's a cute line in a New York Times piece about you where you were asked, what did you know about Iceland before you got there? And it was something like, um, well, I knew about as much as you know when you play Where in the World is Carmen San Diego. <laughs> now, I know you, yes. it's, you, you've improved since then, I know, but... but um, 
Really? That, uh, let, let's face it, not, not much about Iceland is known by the rest of the world, not as much as maybe you'd like to know. But how mm -hmm. much did you know before moving there? I really knew, well, I mean, I guess I learned a bit more. But when I met my husband in 1998, that was before uh, the financial crash that brought attention. That was before this big tourism boom and direct flights from Canada. And so unless you were maybe a, a Canadian of Icelandic descent, I don't think that people knew all that much about the country. Um, I thought it was a similar size to the other Nordic countries and, and not smaller. But I did try quite quickly to learn a little bit, to learn more about it, to try to learn the language. And um, and and now I, I love extolling the virtues of my adopted homeland when I'm traveling. Uh, I'm actually here in Washington to talk about a sort of promotion Iceland festival. And I'll be talking about literature and food and music and all kinds of fun things. So there, there's a lot uh, to get to know about this country. Are you allowed to say who you're meeting later today? <laughs> I am. I th I think so. I'm. Uh, I have a an appointment with First Lady Jill Biden, and uh, I'm very excited to meet her. Going to compare some notes. Well, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to talk to me after <laughs> after the after the meeting. But probably what's said between First Ladies stays between First Ladies. Oh, that's no fun. Oh well. <laughs> I would like to get your conclusions on. I mean, to the extent that that people know something about Iceland, it's that a lot of male bankers led your country into bankruptcy, and then a lot of female bankers got your country out of bankruptcy. And I wonder what lessons you drew from that. Well, that's a that's an excellent question. I think maybe a, a minor oversimplification. Part of that reason is that there were just quite a few more male bankers. Um, but I, I think the more we are going to see women in uh, decision-making roles, the more it's going to increase diversity. And the more diversity we have, the better solutions we have. I think a more relevant example now that we, I hope we see in the global situation is as peace talks, uh, one hopes, continue in the Ukraine, I would very much like to see women at the table there rather than uh, a bunch of men sitting around the table because we know that peace discussions are more effective and long-lasting when they invite women. So I think it's just yet another example of the importance of diversity of all sorts for all kinds of organizations. Since you mentioned Ukraine, does Iceland have a role to play in this current tragedy that's unfolding in Eastern Europe? Well, Iceland is a founding member of NATO, even though we actually have no military. So like every other NATO country, we are... are shocked and, and horrified by what is going on. And I think like many other countries, the people in the country are are donating to charities, are protesting outside the Russian embassy and are really doing what we can. And we have already accepted uh, Ukrainian refugees and will be accepting more and have sent Red Cross workers to the Polish border with the Ukraine and are doing as much as we can to su to support the Ukrainians in this situation. And just to be clear, your, your husband's role is a mostly ceremonial role. He does not have decision-making authority in the country, right? Th th well, he has veto power over laws, but if you're mm -hmm. talking about a situation such as Ukraine, he would not be the person deciding, uh, say, how much money to send or what priority to give. That's correct. Gotcha. You know, you're born in the second biggest country in the world, and now you live in one of the smallest countries in the world. And um, I just wonder if you ever feel isolated when you're in Iceland. No, I don't. You know, I think actually Canada and Iceland have very similar population densities. And, and there's a lot that characterizes the two of us. I mean, Iceland is small on the global stage. Iceland, uh, Canada is small by comparison to its massive neighbor to the south. We both have a little bit what I call in the book uh, sort of with fondness, small nation complex. You know, we're very excited if either Canada or Iceland are mentioned in the in the international news. And, you know, the world, we're just, we're all global citizens these days. It's so easy to travel and, and communicate and speak with each other. So I know I don't at all feel isolated being in Iceland now. And it's, it's not as far away as people think either. Uh, really? Yes, it's closer than, uh, closer to fly from Toronto to Reykjavik than from Toronto to Vancouver. Oh, okay. Well, when you put it that way, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, do I have this right? You got four kids? I do have four kids and a stepdaughter, yes. And do any of them look like they are interested in following in any footsteps into politics? Well, I think the priority really is the NBA or the uh, European Soccer League for my <laughs> son. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens later on. I, they're all, I have three sons and a daughter. They're all very, very much into soccer right now. So uh, we'll see if the professional uh, sporting careers don't work out, what, what next is on the list. So if they don't become World Cup champions, then maybe they might take a look at going into politics. 
We'll see, yeah. <laughs> Got it. Okay, understood. Do you, this may be a, a, a difference without a distinction, but do you see yourself as a Canadian Icelandic or an Icelandic Canadian? That's an excellent question. And I'm just very pragmatic about the answer. Uh, I, it depends on the situation. Probably as a Canadian Icelander. You can hear when I speak that I have my Canadian accent. Um, I, I think what, what, what's been very fortunate about it all is that our, our two countries don't uh, meet very often in important sporting events. So my loyalties haven't been extremely tested thus far. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, I'm very proud to be Canadian. I'm very proud to be Icelandic. But if you say you're a Canadian Icelander, that means mm -hmm. that means your Canadianness modifies what you are, and what you are is an Icelander. Is that right? Well, I've lived. I left Canada when I was 22 years old. Hmm. So I have, and now I'm a little older than 22 years old. So <laughs> I, I've I've now lived a, a large part of my life, my adult life, in in Europe, mostly in Iceland. And, and so to me, that, that has shaped a lot of who I am. And of course, my children are all born in Iceland. But one's upbringing, I think, is, is so important. You know, I was, I was there cheering on our, our, our women's soccer team at the Olympics last summer, like everybody in Canada was. So I, I feel like I can wear both hats. Okay. In our last minute here, uh, since you point out that Toronto is actually closer to Reykjavik than it is to Vancouver, if people go to Iceland, mm -hmm. What's one thing they've got to do if they go? They have to go to an outdoor geothermal swimming pool, which is the most authentic experience. Uh, they're very warm. You can go year round, uh, very, very clean. Great way to meet locals, get some fresh air. You don't have to really swim. You can just sit in a hot tub and I highly recommend it. That sounds very cool. I, I'm a lot older than you though. And I well remember Fisher versus Spassky in Reykjavik. And yeah. I remember Reagan and Gorbachev meeting in Reykjavik as well. And I'm wondering for us history nerds, are there some plaques around where those things happened? It's very interesting you say that. Absolutely. The chessboard that was played is at the Hotel Natura near the local mm. airport. And uh, they have uh, local city tours stop as well, of course, at the um, at Hovde House, which is the house where Reagan and Gorbachev met. And it's not always uh, open to the public, but we still at Besestad, the presidential residence, have the gifts that were presented uh, by Reagan and Gorbachev when they when they arrived in Iceland. So if if uh, if you were ever there when there was an open house or something, people could see those gifts as well. Awesome. We are happy to remind people that you are the author of Secrets of the Sprakar, and we are delighted that it has brought Eliza Reed, the First Lady of Iceland to our virtual studio from Washington, D.C. It's been great to meet you and chat with you. All good wishes going forward and good luck. Likewise, thanks so much for having me, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.